All right, good morning, good afternoon, hello world. How are we all doing this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are? Welcome to another Avid Live Sound webinar. Uh, this morning, we are going to focus on an installation, uh, a, uh, a nightclub installation uh, in New York. And uh, I'm going to invite in uh, my new friend, my brand new friend, uh, Danielle De Palma. Uh, she is the uh, house engineer and technical director at the facility, and she's going to run us through uh, what they all do there and uh, tell us everything good about Venue and SXL there. So, Danielle, good morning. I know it's uh, we're just a little bit afternoon for you, right? We're one o'clock for you. Yeah, you know, in club world. It is still morning. That <laughs> well. Yeah. well stated. Well stated. Well, thanks for joining us today. I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to learn a lot about you today. So um, let's see. Where do we want to kick it off here? I mean, uh, why don't you give us a, I guess let's start by uh, telling us a little bit about uh, the Bowery, right? I mean, uh, tell us how long it's been around. Give us a little bit of the history of the place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was started by Michael Sweer um, back in our opening date, I believe, was early 1998. Yeah, it sounds uh, right. yeah. And in previous iterations of the building, it was an old shoe store. It was um, an old theater. And, uh, and yeah, we took it over, opened in, in 1998. Um, with at the time a yeah, let me get this right I believe it was the Yamaha PM three thousand and <laughs> um, an EAW rig a bunch of six fifty and seven fifty boxes yeah yeah that sounds right for the time sure sure uh, so uh, what's the uh, tell us about the capacity of your place what is it uh, I'm gonna guess it's just looking at pictures of it it's probably about five hundred six hundred seats is that right. Yep, right in between. We sell to about 575 tickets. And is that, I mean, is it all, how, what's the, let's take a look here. I got some pictures of the place. We might as well bring them up here. Uh, so obviously you have a balcony there. So do you guys do primarily standing room uh, shows or is there, are there seated shows, et cetera there? We have tried the seated shows. Yeah, we do have, we do have seats in house, but I think what we are most known for is that standing room only, um, very intimate experience um, at that capacity. And the balcony does let us get away with, with adding a few more um, yeah. people into the room. And the balcony is one of the most sought after places, I think, to see the show. Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot of friends and family up there. Um, it's great sight lines no matter where you go, but the balcony was something that we kind of carried over. Um, at the time, uh, the designers then went on to use Paul Williamsburg in that similar style. Right, right. Well, it's a beautiful looking venue. I mean, I, it, it would be great to go in there and do some shows. Boy, it would be a lot of fun to work in a space that size, you know? So uh, let me ask the obvious question. You know, uh, we're obviously in the pandemic world now. You guys are back to work, obviously. How how many shows are you averaging a week in there? Are you guys doing a number of shows in there now? Yeah, when we came back, it was uh, you know, turning the faucet full on. It went from you know what what was the analogy somebody used like from a from a garden hose to to a fire hose, right? It was, <laughs> right. Uh, it was a great one, and, and we sort of always knew that um, getting getting back to it, which is why we were so intentional with with when and how we reopened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So right now, you know, again, going into the busy season and, and in the club world, we coined the, the phrase of Rocktober. Uh, there is, we're booked about six nights a week on average. Well, congratulations for that. I mean, good grief. Congrats on getting back yep. to work. I think we, that's where we all <laughs> yeah. want to be, right? Yeah, it's, it's so good to be back. All right, so let's talk about, uh, we'll just touch on this briefly because I really want to stay focused on you today, but I think it's worth noting you guys have a sister venue. Is that right, In on the West Coast? Yeah, exactly that. So we have, we hit the market um, with a couple of tiers of showcase spaces. Um, and the sister venue, the Terragram Ballroom, is our, is our LA counterpart of a similar capacity. Um, although I think now they just hit, uh, they just increased their capacity by, um, by decreasing their front of house footprint a little bit. Uh, yeah. 
Is, it, is that the front of house footprint we see in the picture there, that, that kind of square area there? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. They do. I am a little jealous that you get to be on the floor in front of, in front of the PA, which I always envied. Yeah, which is, we'll talk about that coming up here, but you're in the balcony there, right? You guys are set up in the balcony there, which you can see right behind you there, right? We are, yep. Yeah, we yeah. are yeah. In, in our little dugout. Yeah, that presents its own challenges, I'm sure. So. Yeah. Uh, all right. So um, let's talk about you a little bit. Uh, let's get people up to speed on uh, on your role there. How long have you been working uh, with the Bowery? I started, I, I really kind of came up through the ranks, um, teching shows here back in, I want to say 2012, 2013, um, and, and working my way up, starting as a stagehand and getting to, to learn the ropes that way. And um, then moving on to the audio positions, mm -hmm. uh, even even throwing my hand in on once or twice in the, in the lighting world. Um, ultimately, though, I loved the road. I loved the idea of working for an artist um, and seeing a show grow, seeing a consistent show pro start to finish so i yeah, left yeah. to do some touring work um and and then the offer came up in 2016 so not that long ago um uh, to to come on as production manager and, great uh, i truly i i jumped at the at the chance i remember that i remember uh Going into a meeting, not knowing what to expect, <laughs> knowing that it was Bowery and, and feeling it so near and dear to my heart in a place where I can make some some really nice lasting change. Yeah. Well, that's nice. I mean, you know, you work at a place that long, you get some emotional attachment to it and, you know, kind of really take ownership of it. You know, people like that in those venues are gold. I mean, you're, you're a golden person there to be able to do that. So it's great. Uh, so are you still doing any mixing? How much mixing are you doing there a week? I would say if we have six shows a week, right, um, with the headliner, probably one to two nights a week on, on a good day, um, yeah, and a good. lot of support. Um, but a lot of it is system teching and a lot of it is kind of, kind of helping other guest engineers a mm -hmm. lot. Um, Great. Which I truthfully equally enjoy. So awesome. Nice to somebody else's ears on a project. Yeah, yeah. I, I, to me, that's got to be one of the the great things about working in a facility like that. Is you're going to hear every every mixing approach, every style of music, every everything that goes on. You know, I, I kind of in in some ways I kind of miss those days, those very early days of that. It was always fascinating to see what everybody else's approach was going to be to doing something. So you can, you can learn a lot that way. That's for sure. Exactly right. All right. So obviously we're here to talk about S6L today, but I, I always think it's important to, to talk about where you came from, right? With Because uh, obviously you guys replaced uh, your analog consoles. And, and again, not that I want to dwell on this, but you guys worked together with the Tarragon Ballroom to kind of come up with a, the same plan for both places, right? You both have the same console in those in those venues. Is that right? That was it, and that was important. It was important that we did it together and put our brains together and came up with something that made sense for, for both rooms um, and would be you know, really effective and be a great um, step into this next generation of, of yeah, life. Yeah. So you guys, I know you had mentioned to me that you had uh, H3000, a Midas H3000, in your venue, was it the same in the Tarragon uh, Ballroom? It was, it was, our owner loved it. So, so you both had but... H3000? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I can kind of see that at Tarragon, but having an H3000 up in that balcony, I, it kind of begs the question, did you ever le let anybody bring in their own consoles? Never, you know, I will, yes. Um, once where they actually we had to build scaffolding over the desk <laughs> and then lift their console up and over ours. Um, and that was, it was a very long day and a special occasion. Um, but usually it did mean that unfortunately guest consoles did have to go off sides yeah. of, of center of the room. 
That sounds like something I would do. I, I would ask you to do if I came in there, Danielle. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it was, it was fun. It was nice to see it, you know, that it could be done for sure. So tell me, I, you know, I mean, I, obviously we live in the world of digital consoles now, but was there a particular motivation that got you to move to digital, not just necessarily SXL, but where you just thought, okay, we got, we got to go to digital here and, and kind of get in the game, so to speak, of the modern era. Is, is that what drove you there? Modern era, I think so. Yeah, I think um, in my particular case, it was keeping up with analog and how much maintenance it required to where I couldn't effectively manage it in the way that yeah. I wanted to. And then talking with other engineers, you know, and, and having shows come in without a desk and, you know, them saying, I, I love analog. I love this desk. I love all of the outboard that you have, but I can't process, you know, my inputs the way that mm -hmm. I want yeah. on, on analog. And, you know, that's, that's a valid claim. It's uh, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it's so hard to not be romantic about analog. I mean, we, you know, especially for, those of us that have been around it for a long time, you know, it's very, very easy to forget all of the downsides to analog that were in play, you know, all that maintenance, all the noise, the ground loops, all those kind of things, those kind of things just filter away and you just easily forget those and have these romantic notions about it. But, and, and, you know, digital kind of solves all of those problems, you know? So yeah, I feel you there. I feel you there. And especially for a club, you know, where something is going to be sitting and operating every single day, man, I, over, over a period of time, that's got to become a maintenance liability, right? That's, that's it. And, you know, it knock on wood and, and the desk is still going strong. Everything that uh, needed to be done with it, I was, I was able to, to keep done in a way, you know, that still allowed it to function and work as it's yeah. supposed to. But yes, a lot of chasing your tail, a lot of like, you know, once you get to Vader 48, you start back on, on Vader 1 and you just <laughs> keep going. All right. So let's go down the path of how you came to Venue uh, and how do you came to S6L? You know, I, uh, I mean, were there you know, particular kind of evangelists that were saying to you, hey, you need to check out this console. Did you have experience in the past with, you know, maybe Profile or SC48 that kind of piqued your interest? Uh, you know, obviously you worked uh, with the Tarragon and team to be able to kind of come up. How did you guys end up landing on S6L? On it, yeah, it was, I really wanted to remain open, right? So the world was was ours. I, I took input from everyone and we really could have gone anywhere with it um at you know at teragram they had a midas digital at monitors um so they you know they were midas through and through mm -hmm. um it really we had to check certain boxes right it had to most important uh, sound as good or better than the midas and that was something that us in la uh, felt really strongly about. It had to have a proven track record of sounding great. Uh, so that was kind of your g main gating feature was that, hey, if it doesn't sound as good as what we got, we're not going to go there, right? Is that right? That was it. First and foremost, absolutely. We, you know, have numerous accolades about how great the room sounds, um, how much of a joy it is to, to mix here. Uh, and we did we only wanted to, to emphasize that, you know, we didn't want anything that would then we would have to fight to get back to, to sounding to a good place. Yeah. Yeah. How important was a uh, kind of writer friendliness, you know, where, where you had to, you know, kind of had to meet writer demand or be acceptable to writers. Was that an important piece of your formula? Huge. Yeah. That one, I would say, um, just underneath it's sounding good. It's yeah. again, we were seeing a lot of that where, um, we being around as long as we have our capacity um artists loving to do more intimate shows we see everything from a showcase at 600 cap to huge underplays that really want to come back and do a club again yeah um yeah. so it had to check all those boxes with yeah that's a better. that's a pretty wide range of writer demand there i can i can sympathize with you there that's great yeah. So how many, I, I think we might've touched on this, but I'm just going to, I just want to retouch this. So how many shows that you have come in 
uh, you know, have their own mixer, you know, are using, you know, their own front of house engineer. What is it? Three out of their five, six out of 10. I, yeah, I would safely say six to seven out of, out of 10 shows. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of those, probably another half, so another three out of 10 have their own consoles. Yeah. And, you know, again, we'll see what happens post COVID. I, I've already started to see that tours are leaning more on house production yeah. at all level um, because the vendors just don't have it or, um, and save or the cost. bigger stores have it. And that, yeah, and then uh, that's it. And, and they need to consolidate personnel, they need to consolidate gear, they need to figure out a way to or during COVID yeah. in a way that makes sense. I mean, it, not to go down the rabbit hole here with it because we won't have time to do it, but I think post, the post-pandemic world in concert production is going to see a lot of consolidation like that. You're going to see that for over a period of time. And then if we get used to that, it's going to stay that way for a while. It's going to be very interesting to watch. Hi. All right, let's let's uh, let's move on to some of the other tip boxes that you might have needed to tick. I, you know, I'll go back to the screen share here because... That's going to take us to our next one, I think, which is that you guys uh, use a lot of analog gear, right? I love yeah. it. Yes, yes, that was a big point as well. That it that whatever desk we had played really nicely with uh, the pieces of outboard that we still wanted to to keep. Um, you know, this idea that you could have a little bit of the studio world. Uh, sure in in live sound and yeah really get to turn some some physical potentiometers or some physical knobs and and see the changes that they make so are you guys handling this uh, just in terms of interface are you interfacing right to the back of the desk or are you using external io to do inserts etc we chose back of the desk for, yeah. for this one um and that was at our house and i'm not positive about Paragram, um, but at our house, the stage box uh, has to live at front of house as well. Right, yeah. right. Okay, cool. Well, uh, how about how about recording? Are you guys multi-track recording on a nightly basis there, or, or do you offer it up as a service to your uh, to your incoming people? Now we are, and we're seeing a big uptick of it. Yeah. Um, again, going back to not only with digital audio, but another way we grew um, to be able to reopen after and during the pandemic is uh, is with live streaming. Um, yeah. So we're seeing a huge uptick in folks uh, recording not only the audio, but the video or any content um, going forward. And it has been such a joy to truly be so plug and play with, uh, with Pro Tools and just to be able to offer that to somebody at such high resolution. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing to me even today. I, I mean, I get blinded by a little bit because I work for Evan so closely at times, but I'm just surprised how many people don't realize how easy that is to do with Venue, you know? I mean, it's just so simple to pull it off now and, and have it be really high quality, so. And then so, in particular house, what's been really nice is just the virtual sound check, you know? Is of course, yeah. Back and then going through the desk and having people get more comfortable with audio coming down channels. Mm -hmm. So that's been really nice as well. So when you guys, when did you guys do your, make your decision and get your install done? Can you give me some sense of time there? I, I, I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Yeah. It was, was Venue 7, was that release part of, uh, was that in play when you guys made your decision? That is an excellent question. Um, if it... I don't believe it was. I think that that was something that when we when we made the decision and started going to vendors um, for quotes and service and things, that was right around the time that we saw um, and started digging into the world of, of Venue 7 a yeah. bit. Yeah. Uh, the reason I ask, I, I was just wondering how important some of those features might have been to you, you know, things like bus to bus, all the bus to bus options, uh, you know, the mix minus capability, the two track recording and playback, you know, the automatic delay compensation. Did any of those things play into your decision making? I have to say truthfully, no, but now that we have them, it is <laughs> it's 
such a joy. So it really is sort of the icing on the cake at that point of, um, of gosh, just this huge sigh of relief of like, oh, this is so much easier. This is yeah. exactly, you know, where I used to have so many different workflows, right, in previous versions of a venue to kind of get what I what I wanted to or how I wanted to achieve something. It was just like, oh, now there's a button that just does it, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, after I've been on seven for a while now, it's just like, how did we ever mix on this before I had seven? You know, I mean, <laughs> you, you fall so in love with it so quickly. That was oh. totally my experience. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit uh, about your infrastructure there. You know, we can actually start with something you mentioned previously there, which is you have your front of uh, your stage rack sitting at front of house, right? So that tells me that you have some analog, you know, infrastructure there. You've basically just taken a digital console and turned it into a drop-in replacement for an analog console. Is that is that right? For all intents and purposes, yeah. Um, our analog split uh ran through the balcony uh, yeah. and and that was something where kind of taking out that infrastructure somehow it seemed a little more daunting than taking <laughs> out a 500 pound desk um but we did while we pulled out all of the cabling for um the inserts and a lot of the outboard and things like that and all of the pt patch bays um we kept just the, the straight split um, between monitors in front of house. Yeah, so yeah. We dropped the stage box right in. Um, you know, the other point was that the drive lines come, come up uh, to front of house as well. Um, and again, just getting those from a very much plug and play, even though we did transition from analog to uh, to AES, um, we ended up, you know, still doing the same thing, still dropping that right. 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 Yeah, that had to make things much easier just for the drop in for sure, I would think. So tell us a little bit about your PA configuration. What, you can talk a little bit about your PA. Tell us what you got in there. Tell us, you know, how many zones you got, what you're driving. I mean, obviously, it's a small place, but I'm, I'm betting you still got some, you know, some, some good drive system going on there. We got some fun stuff. Yeah, it um, it stemmed from, again, our old EAW rig back in the day, which was designed with such a large center cluster to really fill the majority of the room with kind of, you know, with a little less going on in the left and right than you might think. And our owner thought that, you know, that was a really important foundation to, to the sound and why the club sounds so good. Um, so when we switched over to DMB, which was done before I came on as PM, about a year before, um, they kept a similar configuration, just kind of driven a little differently. So we have five zones all together, um, a left, right, center, uh, front fills, and then the subs. Nice. Okay. And do you... Uh... I mean, on a given day, do you do you kind of mandate how people drive that, or is it kind of an open architecture where people can kind of drive the system any way they want to drive it in terms of what signals go where? Open open architecture, and I think that that one was really important for me um, coming on. You know, as as PM, uh, and one of the reasons I came on was was to make sure that the room still sounds as good after yeah. the new install happened. There was some um, hesitancy over how to treat uh, the PA and make sure it sounds as good. And one of the things that was really important to me is that flexibility of, of how to drive it, depending on the artist. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a very loud band on our stage, and again, we're, we're small and, and we're not very deep, um, that, center, that center fill really does come in handy to... You know, if you wanted to drive that separately and feed just a little more vocal into the yeah. center, that really just kind of makes it pop a little more. Um, well, you know, kind of speaking of that, I, I know I'd ask you pre-webinar if you could uh, set up a screen share where we might look at your drive from the console. Were you able to accomplish that? We, can we have a look at it? Yeah, let's take a peek here. Awesome. Yeah. Let's do that. Uh, show you. So, oh, there we go. 
So what's uh, what kind of outputs are you using to drive the PI? Are you using matrices or just the primary left and right outputs? Matrix outputs. Auxiliaries. Let me just show you that here. And the matrix mixer of uh, Venue 7 is probably my favorite thing, right? Um, <laughs> and being able to, to really assign whatever you want to, to it. Um, ultimately, yes, the matrix outputs are then what feed uh, the amps to the PA. So in most the times and how I like to, to start my mixes um, is that most everything just gets a mix of the left, right, either individually or, um, or a sum of the left, right. Yeah. And then are you, uh, I, the screen is a little too far away for me to see it. I hope the, the, um, the audience can see it. What are your sources? Can you want to just go through your sources there for that particular matrix? That's for the, the center fill, right? Yeah. Exactly that, and you can uh, yeah talk to you that a little bit. Um, I see the left, right. The left, and right. Yep, yeah, summed um, at zero because the the DMB takes their processing for the center there. Um, iPod always, and that's a fun little club trick. Less so for for the center, um, but for the feed to the to the downstairs bar or uh -huh. satellite sources. Um, and then we have all of the groups. Um, so I like to work in, in group mixing and I have all of our outboard coming up to the groups um, mm -hmm. as indicator inserts. And that's a way, again, to kind of get, let's say the center needs a little more vocal and the vocals are on this group. I'll just inch that in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, we have, what did I do? A couple of my go-to effects. Um, I am a little guilty of being effects heavy and a little more so, you know, in this room, I feel like listening on cans versus what's actually happening in the room. Um, I feel like the effects are a little more present when you're not in a space. And so having the effect um, on as a mix minus, and that's to, for again, any satellite mix, any broadcast or anything yeah. like that, um, kind of dry up the vocals or dry up the band a little bit more. Oh, that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Um, and then beyond that, it is all the guest stuff, um, which I kind of always have in there as a fail safe. So whenever we get a guest console coming in, um, and let me see if I can show you that here, if you're able to kind of see that, but they go in and uh, let's see if uh, this side for you here. Yeah, there you go. If you can kind of make that out, if they come in and they hit what's called input direct, right? So they're bypassing any of the processing right. that would normally right. happen on a channel. Awesome stuff. So, you know, obviously you're taking advantage of the delay compensation that's now on venue uh, seven using the matrixes that way for the mix minuses. That's really great. It's kind of, kind of a neat way to do it. So you're obviously feeding more zones than just the PA zones as well. Then you're feeding dressing rooms and lobbies and other things like that, right? Exactly that. Yeah. yeah. Let me show you that there on the outputs. Um, but it is what we have total. Yeah, it's definitely the downstairs bar um, and the upstairs dressing room because that is above the stage. You can't really hear what's going on there at all. Um, again, another record out if you need it, and that's just to do something different from the left, right, if somebody wanted to switch that up, and that goes right to the two-track recording. Um, and then broadcast mixes for yeah. any of the live streaming. Yeah, that's what I, that was the next place I was going to go. Are you facilitating any kind of <clears throat> you know, processed mix to be able to take up to stream? Are you, you know, are you paying attention to LUFS levels, anything like that on the console at this point? Exactly that. And again, in very early stages of it, um, it's, it's something where I would love to, to grow with it and, and have somebody uh, down in a remote location, you know, mm -hmm. also checking my work because it is, that's, that's the really tough part is to mix for front of house and also be cognizant oh, totally. of what's going on in the broadcast mix. 
Absolutely, it is. We, and we're all finding it out the hard way. <laughs> so, yes. yeah, no, there, you know, there's a lot of discussion right now going on about the different ways to stream. Matter of fact, I, tonight at 6 30, I'm doing another webinar on all these kind of different streaming architectures to be able to use uh, from other uh, other sources. So, so you know, uh, I guess it you know, also begs the question here if you're doing all of this, you know, it, are there times when you're doing front of house and monitors from the, the balcony location? I mean, if you have a smaller show, do you, does it require that your monitor console be online or do you guys just take care of it from front of house? I'd like to get us to a place where we take care of it from, from front of house and we're certainly set up to. Um, it, and that's, that's what's really nice. And again, gosh, all of the auxiliary outputs uh, are really saving, saving the day here. Um, you know, so really on any given day, um, I am just using auxes one through eight, and those are my, my effects ends. Um, if, again, we're doing different drive for the PA, auxes nine and 10, then become uh, my fills and my sub sends, mm -hmm. and it depends on auxes that way. Um, auxes 11 through 24 really don't get much love right now. And then I, I start <laughs> uh, the monitor mixes on, on aux 25. Um, and again, that's, that's, in the system processing as well, right? And how they treat that and how snapshots treat the different auxes. Um, and yeah, they're all, they're set up um, pre-fade and they're set up to drive our monitoring system analog rather than the digital that our monitor desk does. Right, right. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I mean, it sounds like you got all the bases covered. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it, it's so nice to have a redundant system, though, right? I mean, gosh, before that, you know, it was it was like pulling teeth if you tried to, to make the Midas, you know, come up with a monitor mix. And there wasn't yeah. such a thing as uh, double blessing your channel so you could process them differently for monitors. Yeah. Um, yeah, it became a little tricky. So this is this is nice um, for having some fail safes, for getting a little creative, um, and gosh, for being able to mix in ears. That's something that you'll see a lot. That you know, we'll get guest front of house engineers, um, and our guys will do the band's wedges, but uh -huh. the guest front of house engineer will do the ears. And oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to be honest. That's the first time I've heard of somebody doing that, but that's, that's a really interesting concept there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is kind of, I think something that we're, we're starting to see a little more of and it's, and again, having this desk, especially if they're using the house desk, which a couple of them have been now, um, it makes it much easier. Well, I'm going to have to address that in an upcoming webinar. It sounds like, so that'll be fun. Um, you know, I, I give them the time of, and space we're in, in in this point in history, Daniel. I got to ask you, are you guys uh, bannering around the idea of going, uh, you know, maybe uh, expanding your PA system to do immersive or surround uh, in your venue? Uh, that would be my dream, truly. I remember uh, seeing a show in, in New York with, uh, with a DMV immersive system and... Uh, it was, it really took things to a whole new level. Yeah. Well, especially in a venue your size. I mean, it's it's so well suited to it because, you know, you have the least amount of propagation challenges there, et cetera. So it's really great. And, you know, the thing I love about the way immersion is coming online in live sound is that you can take your existing PA structure and just use it as the bed mix and then just, you know, add the immersion Exactly. And just use your existing PA drive as objects in the DSP processor and immersify it. You know, it's just fantastic. And it's so easy to do now. Right. That that part has been truly mind blowing. And I would love to, to mix more shows in that way. Well, I'm going to bet, I'm just going to bet, because I, I, I've come to know you a little bit now. We're going to be back on another webinar here in a little while talking about the immersive install at That's the Bowery and the Tarragon Ballroom. So. <laughs> Or Terragram Ballroom. So, <clears throat> well, Danielle, this has been fantastic. I, I I really appreciate you taking some time to talk to us here. Um, uh, I cannot thank you enough for having me. Yeah, and and really with with all of Avid support through through this whole thing, that was a big contingent for us. Right, is is having the support is uh, me fumbling into the world of digital after making <laughs> analog for so long. And uh, yeah, y'all have been. 
truly great about it. So well, you. I'm going to stop by and see you in person next time I'm in New York. So, you know, get yeah. ready. We're going out for coffee. We're going to have some lunch and we're going to talk S6L and, and other things. Why not? All right. So uh, I guess we're going to get to a Q&A portion of the uh, presentation here. I'll see if anybody's got any questions in the background. Uh, hey, guys. So, how are you? <laughs> hey, good. Chant. Bopping nice to see here. you. Thanks for bopping in. <laughs> so Chant's been capturing questions in the background by the viewers and stuff. So we'll see what he's yeah. got for us. So uh, there's a few here. So um, so far, everything's been awesome, guys. Uh, how big is the crew at the clubs? Ooh, good question. Um, on a normal show call, it is myself acting as production manager and front of house engineer. Uh, we have a lighting designer, a monitor engineer, and a, and a stage manager. And is it the same for both clubs? It is, yeah. That grows if, again, it's an underplay and we need to hire yeah. additional loaders or staff and things like that, but that's the core for... The core group. Cool. Great. Uh, let's see another one here. Do you use a laptop or tablet to control the console remotely from the floor? And if so, what do you use for setup for that? Mm, yes. And you know what? I don't know if I have it with me, but I do just use a little iPad. So both, right? Um, I actually mostly use the iPad as the function pad, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with, with venue, but yeah um what i will say what i do most often is just play some stuff get it to a good spot and then just walk the floor uh, and what i what i'm used to doing is actually using the tablet that controls our pa processing right the dmb the r1 um and there are certain eq and level adjustments that i can do within that um but again from the days of analog i was used to picking that up and doing that so i Old, old dog, new tricks, as they say. <laughs> uh, but the function pad of, of uh, venue with, with the iPad app has been really nice. Cool. Yeah, I didn't even ask you about that, and I meant to do it. It's right on my list here. Completely forgot. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I, I love the function pad app. I think it's just the greatest thing we've come up with venue for venue in a long time. There was another question here um, that they had, and they weren't they weren't clear on how you were describing it. So it says, uh, the reverb, so the reverb effects are not sent to the left, right. So you can send them to dry, uh, send it dry to record. If so, does it become too dry? Is that the way you've got it set up? You were mentioning how you wet, you make make the room a little bit wetter, but you keep them uh, on a uh, mix minus. So you can send drier, uh, a drier mix to um, other devices and rooms. Yeah, let me. I'm going to try my best to explain it and you let me know if, if I'm on the right track with what they're asking. Um, but no, the reverb does go out to the left, right. Um, the reverb, any delay effects that I do, really any effects are going through the master bus. Um, where, uh, where I do dry it up then is using the mix minus function, right? Is It's using the um, effect returns, which I think is what you saw up there. Um, so the stereo effects returns from the reverb, that comes down the matrix as well as the left and right. And so that, um, I flip the phase of the effect return and then send that at, you know, a, a level minus three, minus six, something like that. And that is ultimately what dries up the feed. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe I, I maybe I can try to help you out a little bit there, or help the uh, question asker out a little bit there. If yeah. uh, if she has the effects in the left right bus, and then adds a version of the left right or, or, or of the effects return to the matrix out of phase, if they're at exactly the same level in both places, there'll be complete cancellation. But as you move one down or up, if you move that effects return down or up within the matrix, you'll be adding more effects, more or less effects to that that dry send, right? So I, I think I think it's a beautiful way to do it, Danielle. That's a, I mean, that's yeah. a really clever thing to do there. Really good. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and you know, I did the commissioning at the Teragram, and I can't remember this, and I wasn't clear. Are there monitor consoles there? When I was there, it was it was kind of torn up. We only focused on the front of house. Are, do you have monitor consoles at both locations? Both locations, yeah. Right. Um, and they're both S6Ls? 
No, I those those we ended up keeping um, okay. from the previous install. So Teragram, I believe, has a pro two or three um, okay. a Midas Digital, and uh, and we have a Digico SD twelve. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I just wasn't clear on that. That's all good. And yep. then uh, you guys do have a lot of analog gear as well as the Teragram. Uh, are you guys using it as much as you expected to now with SXL? Good question. I am, and I still love it. Um, yes, I'm a big fan of of group mixing, and I love just again from from the old analog days, knowing where my groups are and what's going to them. Um, it has been a little bit of teeth pulling to get guest engineers to use it. You know, you <laughs> know them and, and it's all lit up and it looks great. And it's like, look, it's nice and easy. It's just on the group, just touch the hardware insert button. And, um, you know, they, uh, they're they still a little hesitant, but, uh, but I enjoy yeah. it. And that's my, you know, that's my little moment of zen there. But you can quickly bypass it so they don't have to use it easily, you know, on the, the groups, right? The hardware insert button. That, that's cool. That's so nice, yeah. It's so it's there if they want to use it. Uh, speaking of that, um, guest engineers, how receptive have they been to using S6Ls? Um, much more than the heritage, I have to say. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, you always felt a little bit of the trepidation when they came on to the analog desk, you know, and it was a lot of... Um, a lot of encouraging and a lot of uh, but babysitting as well. And now with, uh, with these desks and something that, you know, another thing I really pride myself on doing is that our tech pack um, is interactive in the same way that all of your literature is, um, but you can actually click like here's some downloads and I have our house start file um, on a clickable link for anyone to download um, so they can start building offline and, and understand how our, you know, consoles put together. So I think that that really encourages a lot of people um, having resources and, and support links directly in our tech pack uh, encourages a lot of people. And uh, generally, yeah, the response has been really receptive. Cool. I think that's all the questions we have for today. All right. All right. Well, again, Danielle, thank you very much for your time today. And thanks for, for sharing all this great info with us. I think you got a great thing going on there. I can't wait to come and see it and hear it. So, uh, so happy to see you. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, folks, we will wrap it up here today. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your great questions. And uh, look for us to have more and more uh, Avid Live Sound webinars going forward. There's no shortage of topics to talk about. That is for certain. So until next time, we will see you guys. Uh, we'll see you guys out doing shows. So that's kind of how we're going to be working going forward. We'll see you guys later. Thanks again for tuning in. Bye-bye.